It's going to help me hand these out, if you don't mind doing this. Uh, I've never done this before, but I'm going to, I'm going to hand you the homework and your message for the week uh, as, as a start. So you want to grab hold of these. There's a couple of people that's going to help me hand them out. Um, but you're going, to get, you're going to get one of these. And the reason you're getting it now is if you want to make notes on it, you're welcome to do this. So I should have brought the version along that I did before Karen got a hold of it. Um, it was black and white. And it was not nearly um, as as well done. Okay, so but this is this is the um, this is essentially what I'm going to share today. And if it looks busy, and if there is a lot, that's why I'm going to speak quickly. Okay, so you've got to listen quickly. I know the busyness was all me. I, I'll take full responsibility for the busyness. Okay. But um, you're welcome to fold it, you're welcome to work with it, you're welcome to scratch on it, do whatever you like on it. The fact of the matter is that you're probably going to have to spend some time on this during the week. So, so if, you, if you like receiving pieces of paper, that's great. If you don't like receiving pieces of paper, there's dustbins on the way out, okay? Um, fact of the matter is that if you need extras, I do believe there'd be a couple of extras if you feel like you want to take some for somebody at the end. But the whole idea of this is that you grab hold of this and then that you work through this and as the week progresses, in the next couple of weeks, you spend some time prayerfully on this. There's no way we're going to cover all of this in the next 30 minutes or so, okay? It simply isn't possible, okay? We can't cover all of this in the limited time that we have together, but we're going to cover some of it. Um, and the purpose of this conversation is for you to discover your purpose. So the purpose of this conversation is, is essentially, you'll see right in the middle, the words here that says my purpose, my hope is that the conversation today, that this journey today that we're going to go on together, that it will get you to finding a statement, to finding an understanding of what your individual purpose is. Now, I, I, I can't repeat everything I've said the last four weeks, but all of that is context to what we're saying today. So, so your purpose isn't aside from God's big purpose, isn't aside from your community, right? We've spoken about these things over the last couple of weeks. And our purpose happens when we give priority to God and His will over our lives. We spoke about that last week. And we spoke about God's destiny a couple of weeks ago and how He's got an eternal destiny and plan for your life. All of those things that we've done over the last couple of weeks creates context for the conversation we're having today. And my hope is that as we journey through this conversation, that you will have a moment when you will discover your destiny. Now, you might sit here and go, but Yuri, I know what my destiny is. I know what my purpose is. I know what God has made me for. I know what His idea is over my life. That's great. This exercise will affirm and confirm that. Um, it'll, it'll accelerate that. It'll make you feel more like, yes, this is what God has called me for. Um, and if you don't know what it is, maybe today will represent a great realignment in your life or a, or a moment where you could have an aha moment and go, wow, that's what God created me for. Okay, you guys ready? You're right, a little overwhelmed? Okay, it's okay, it's a lot. I get it, okay, here we go. So the idea here comes from the life of Paul. Paul is living his life, and he's, he's got this incredible um, ministry. He's one of the leaders of the Jews. He's been promoted into a level of great authority. He, studied, he went to the right school, studied the right things, and this Jesus sect comes along, right? So this Jesus person appears, and it, it seems to be taking everybody astray. Um, Paul, at this point in time, called Saul, he, he, he makes up his mind that he will give his life to eradicate the world of this, this, this false teaching called Jesus, okay? He's going to get rid of it. And, and, and he, he puts all his effort into it. In fact, he doesn't just put his effort into it, but he, 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 he gives his life to it, and he asks others to support him as he tries to eradicate this world of this vermin, of this, of this wrong idea called Christianity. But on his way to Damascus to go and eradicate that, that town, from Christianity, he has this moment, this encounter where God appears to him, and it's, I mean, it's radical. There's blindness involved, and, and, and light shining, and people falling off horses. There's the whole thing, and, and in this moment, God comes, and he, 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 he turns his destiny. He ever so slightly just moved Saul along, and Saul would become Paul, and this guy would end up writing two-thirds of the New Testament, and most of the church as we have it today, comes out of his life and his journey as he would put it together. 
And this moment takes him into his destiny. Now, nobody can look at Paul's life and say, this guy didn't know what God created him for, right? I mean, that's going to be a hard argument to make. If you, if you read his writings, if you look at his impact on the church, if you, if you think about the fact that here we are, 2,000 years later, still speaking about his life, clearly the destiny, the plan, the calling of God over, over Paul's life was lived out. It was fulfilled. He knew his purpose. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that most of us, if we had to say what was Paul's purpose, why did God create Paul, I think most of us would be able to come up with a, with a basic idea of what was God's call over Paul's life. So God had a call over Paul's life, and Paul lived that life. And if you, if you think through his life, you'll see that that, that life could be, could be depicted on these five things. His call could be defined in these five things. So you'll see firstly the spirit, right? We just spoke about the spiritual moment where it all came together, where God came and he said, Paul, this is what I created you for. I'm going to send you there and I'll show you all that I've called you for, right? So there's a spiritual moment where God makes it clear. There's something in the heart of Paul. If you, if you study Paul's story, then there's something in his heart that's connected to his call. It, it's, he's compelled, he often says. He he lived this life because he was compelled to it. Even when he didn't know Jesus, his heart and his passion was some of the things that he did. He was a teacher. He, he did these things. If you look at Paul's aptitude, he had a natural ability to, to preach. He, he was a preacher. He, he understood the word. He communicated it. Even before he knew Jesus, there were some natural skills and giftings that God placed in him to do that, his personality certainly lined up with it. Paul wanted to go. I mean, even when he was eradicating Christianity, he wanted to go do it in another place. And his whole apostolic call and his, the, the trips that God would call him to go on, the, it was part of his personality. And lastly, if you look at his experiences and the way God set him up, God set him up for what he called him to do. So it's real easy for us to look at Paul's life and to say, well, Paul had a call from God, and he figured out what that call was, and he lived it out. Easy as that, right? He, he discovered his shape, spirit, heart, aptitude, personality, and experience. You guys will remember four weeks ago, I mentioned that, and I said, that's how we discover our call is. We look at our shape, right? We look at Paul. We say, listen, this was his shape. This was his call. It's lined up. Black and white. Simple. Well, somebody said this. He said, history is red in black and white, but history is made in gray. And here's the thing. When we look back, it's easy for us to put it in little categories, put it in little boxes, and make all sense of it, and write a neat little statement. If we look back at the, at the Second World War, it's universally accepted that the Second World War was caused by the decisions made at the end of the First World War to restrict German freedom, right? So decisions made, those decisions caused the Second World War. The last thing they wanted to do when they made the decisions at the end of the First World War was cause the Second World War. It was the very last thing they would want to do, but it was lived not in black and white of looking back at history. It was lived in the gray of real life. And they made the best decisions they could with the, the things they had. So what we're doing today is we're going to use the black and white of looking back at Paul's life. And we're going to say, well, if I look back at Paul's life, then it helps me to see what my destiny is, what my purpose is. And yes, it is murky at times. And yes, it isn't always as clear cut. And maybe one day when the history books write about you, they'll easily be able to put it into black and white and determine exactly what it was that you were called for. But in real life, it's going to have interesting angles to it. It's going to be interesting to figure out. It's going to have great moments to it. But you've got to try. Because there is nothing more important in your life than knowing why you have been created. There is nothing more important for you to figure out than the answer to this. Other than knowing that you are saved in Christ, the next most important thing you need to understand is why. What does he want to do through your life? Okay, can, I, can we quickly do a real simple explanation? Just this is like, okay, this is like real easy. Okay, I'm going to dumb it down for you real quick. Is heaven better than earth? Yes, okay, so heaven is better than earth. Does God want the best for you? Yes. Okay, heaven is better than earth, 
right? And God wants the best for you. What on earth are you doing here? It's real simple, isn't it? Heaven is better than earth. God wants the best for you. If you're saved in Christ, you're going to heaven. Why are we on earth? Well, you're on earth because he's got something left to do with you, because he's got a purpose for you. He's got a plan for you. If God didn't have something left for you to do, I want to tell you, you will no longer be here. As long as I have something left to do, my life cannot be taken from me because it belongs to God. And the reason I'm on this planet is because he has something left for me to do. So what I need to figure out is what is that something that he has left for me to do, that he has purposed, that he has planned for me to do. So we're going to take some time and we're going to look at these. And what you'll see is as we go through shape, spirit, heart, attitude, personality, and experience, as we go through those, you'll see that every one of them has two questions. That's the bit outside of the circle, the two questions. And those questions, you'll see there's a lot of white page around them. The reason is they're not rhetorical questions. They're questions that deserves you taking the time to answer them. They're questions that deserves you taking some time to go through them. So number one, spirit. Our destiny ultimately is a spiritual issue. We, are, we have been created by God that is spirit in the image of God that is spirit. And that God is the one that created us with a plan and a destiny. And if we're going to live in our destiny, we're going to hear it from him. The one that created us has the ability to speak to us. So the first question is, what is the witness of the Holy Spirit in your spirit? What does God say to you? What is his heart? What is his desire? What is his message in your heart? What is that thing that, that God wants to speak to you about? What are the things that, that he's spoken to prophetically over you when you pray? What arises in your heart? What is, what is he stirring with you? Romans chapter 8 verse 14 says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. If you take the scripture and you just turn it around, it says that the children of God are led by the Spirit of God. It is our birthright to be led by the Spirit of God. As children of God, the Spirit of God leads and guides us. We, we spoke about John chapter 10 earlier in the series, and we spoke about the fact that he says that my sheep know my voice. We, God has the ability to lead and guide us. Jeremiah 33 verse 3, call to me and I will answer you. God will answer you. If you want to know what your destiny is, ask the one that gave you destiny. And believe that he will speak to you. Believe that God can speak to you and share with you. James chapter 1 verse 5 to 7 speaks about if any one of you lacks wisdom, he must ask. How often... Do we go through life lacking understanding, not having asked? How often do we struggle? How often do we have a tough time? How often do we have a difficulty understanding? But we've never sat down and asked. And maybe you're saying, and you're saying, man, I really want to know what my purpose is. I really want to know what my destiny is. God, what have you created me for? But you've never sat down and said, God, what have you created me for? Expecting him to answer. Second question, what career or ministry do you feel the peace of God about going into? See, um, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15 says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And it's one of my favorite scriptures because it, it speaks of this idea, um, Colossians 3, 15, speaks of this idea of, of us, us living under the rule of the peace of God. It's the next slide, please, Clyde. Um, it, it's us living under the rule under the, of the peace of God. So the peace of God re gets to rule whether you're inside or outside of the will of God, right? When, you, when you're watching a game of football and there's a particular call by the umpire, the umpire needs to call whether you're in or out, right? And then you watch the review because you want to make sure it's a referee. Okay, I'm sorry. It's the referee. There's, there's um, wrong sport. Um, <laughs> The referee makes the call whether you're inside or outside. Now, if you look at the Greek word being used here in this particular scripture, it says, and let the peace of God rule in your heart. The Greek word used for rule there is the word umpire, as it's translated. But for our sake, we'll just say referee, right? Because it's the same thing, okay? We'll go for referee. It's the one that says you're in or you're out. 
And, and whether you're in or you're out is what the, the peace of God does. Now, here's the thing. Some of us are paralyzed by not knowing what to do, so we do nothing, and if you do nothing, guess what? The referee will never be able to help you whether or not you're in or out because you would have done nothing. If you're doing nothing, the referee makes no calls about your life. And when we don't move, when we don't try, when we don't do something, the peace of God can't lead us. Now, this is the way I lead my life. I, if, if I feel like something might be God, I go for it. If the peace of God stays as I'm going for it, then I'm going for it. But when the peace of God leaves, then I stop. Because the peace of God rules in my heart. He's the one that referees whether I'm in or whether I'm out of his desires and his call for my life. It's like a bicycle. You can't turn a bicycle when it isn't moving. We can't find our destiny when we're not moving, when we're not going along and moving on. I trust more in God's ability to correct my mistakes than what I trust in my ability to make the right decisions. An inability to choose, an inability to act, an inability to risk is an inability to trust God. Because if we believe Romans 8.28 to be true, what does it say? It says, God has the ability to work all things together for the good, for those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. What does it say? It says, when you're called according to God's purpose, God has the ability to get you to His purpose even when you make mistakes. This is awesome. This means I can try and fail and still get to the purpose if I know that I'm called by God and called according to His purpose. It's not paralyzing, it's empowering. And too often, we are paralyzed not by our overly faith in God or us trusting God too much. It's, we're paralyzed by the fact that we're not trusting God enough to say, God, even when I miss you, I believe that you have the ability to get me there. Now, do I try and miss it? No. I'm trying to serve God with all my heart. And if I do, <laughs> if I do, God has the ability to get me there. Okay, second one, Heart. So we discover our destiny by understanding what the Spirit says about it. Second one is heart, okay? Heart speaks about what is in your heart. It, it, this is, I'm not speaking about the organ, by the way, okay? I'm not speaking about the organ in your heart. I'm speaking about the inner center of who you are, okay? The core of your being. Uh, here's the question, what is the desire of your heart? You, you hear people kind of have long conversations about what men want and what women want. Well, I want to ask you, what do you want? And most often when it comes to our destiny, we don't ask that question. What do I want? What is it that I want to do? Because I believe that if God is the one that makes us, and God makes us for a particular purpose, He takes what He makes us for and He puts it in our hearts. What do you want? What do you want to do? So the, one of my favorite scriptures is Psalm 37, okay? And in particular, verse 4, it says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, for too long in my life, I read the scripture like this. If I delight myself in God, He will give me what I want. Do you read it like that? Okay, do you like that translation? Okay, delight yourself in God, and He will give you what you want. I think if we put that on a bumper sticker with a 512 logo, we'll get a lot of people coming here, okay? Just, just come, we're just, just like Jesus, and He'll give you whatever you want. That's not what this verse says. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. This verse says, not like, if you like God, He'll give you what you like. It says, if you like God, you'll like the things He likes. That's what this verse says. It says the things that he has positioned in you, the things that he has made you for, the things that he has built in your heart, the more you like God, the more those things would come to the fore. The more you'll enjoy doing those things. I want to tell you, for some of you, if you like God, the more you like God, the more you like math. For some of you, the more you like God, the more you like biology. For some of you, the more you like God, the more you like making business deals and making a lot of money. 
For some of you, the more you love God, the more you love being creative and, and telling stories. Each and every one of us, I want to tell you what God has put in your heart. The more you like God, the more that thing would, would grow and it would become the desire of your heart. Because what? It's God's desire that He's placed inside of you. He embedded inside of you. What is in your heart? And as you draw close to God, what is showing up bright? The second question I want you to spend some time on here is the question, what stirs your passion? What gets you going? What gets you excited? What will, what will cause you to do things you won't normally do? Okay, what, what are those things? I, now, many of you know this about me. They say that leaders are readers. Well, if leaders are readers, then I'm not a leader. I don't like reading. I, I, I get an amen there from the back. Okay, I don't like reading. It, it isn't fun. I don't, people that, Read for fun is an anomaly to me. <laughs> I just, it just doesn't make sense. Reading's hard work. But you know what? I'll read about the things that I'm passionate about because it's part of me. So I, it doesn't matter how much. I like sleep. Anybody else? Okay. Am I alone in this? But I want to tell you, when I get busy with what I'm passionate about, I couldn't care less about sleep because there's an internal power. Passion is the life like fuel is to a car. It drives you. And there's this, this great scripture where, where Jeremiah, that is this reluctant prophet to the people that are dispersing, he makes this statement. He says, I can't keep quiet because his words burn within me. And I think sometimes our passion is like it. It's this thing that, that burns within you. You can't go without it. The third thing we want to consider when we want to discover our destiny is this idea of aptitude. And we want to, we, we, we want to look at our aptitude. And, and aptitude refers to not who you are as much as it refers to what you do, right? So, so aptitude speaks of the things that you have a natural ability to do well. That's your aptitude. It's your, it's your natural abilities. It's the skills that you've been given. And, and, and I'm sure you've looked at people with great aptitude in certain areas, and you've said these words, I could never do that. Yes? Because they have certain aptitude. They have certain abilities. They've got certain skills, but what are those things that God has given you? God has given each and every one of us particular things He does. Where God leads, He provides. And in the case of your purpose, in the case of your destiny, I believe God provides over the generations as He puts our genes together. He's been setting us up to do certain things in a certain time, in a certain way, and He has prepared us to do those things, and He's given us the skills we need. So the question here is what flows out of you naturally, okay? And I know it's a question that... I just don't know how to say it otherwise, okay? I, I, I know this could be interpreted wrong. Don't do that, okay? What, what happens naturally in your life? What do you just do? What just, what just happens? It was very early in my life that I figured out that God's purpose, purpose and destiny for my life was not to be an athlete. It was not to run. It doesn't come naturally for me, okay? It doesn't just happen, okay? I, it's, I, I can see some of you are feeling released today. I release you, okay? If, if God hasn't made you to run, don't run. Okay, bees bee and flies fly. They do it because they've been made to do it. Okay, I, I mean, I, 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 I look at some people in the medical profession, you know, like Jason, and, 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 and he, just, he just loves talking about all these gross things that happen to people. And I go, man, if that was my job, if I had to wake up every morning to kind of, you know, dig into people's cuts and bruises and blood and, oh, man, it would be tough for me to wake up. I might end up bruising myself a little bit. But I look at Jason, he's so excited. He's like, you wouldn't believe what I saw today. I got to fix this guy up. And I'm like, oh, man. What comes naturally for you? What God has made you to do, he would put the abilities to do that in you. I was always under the impression that, that people just like speaking to people. You know, I, I, I was always thinking, how could, how could it be a fear for people to do public speaking? It's the easiest thing in the world. You just stand up and speak, right? 
But apparently, some people are mortified by it. I have no idea why. It's a natural ability. What is that ability that God has given you? Romans 12 verse 6 says, God has given different gifts for doing certain things well. What are the gifts that he has given you to do things well? I believe that God gives every single person on this planet the gifts to do certain things well. When we discover those gifts, we discover our destiny. It's embedded in us. It's, it's part of us. Next question, where do you produce fruit? Where do you bear fruit to produce results? See, I, I believe that when we do something well, there's fruit on it. There's an anointing on it. There's, a, there's something that happens to it, you know? So, so Luke 6 verse 44 says that a tree is known by its fruit, right? So, so bearing fruits is a natural process for a tree. Uh, apple trees don't have to think about making apples. They just make apples. They, ha- they bear fruit. So which areas of your life do you, do you see a particular anointing on? Do you, do you see a particular thing happen? I'll, I'll never forget one of the first times I stood up to speak in front of a large crowd of people. It worked. It probably didn't work because of me, but there was an anointing on it. It was as if God was telling me, Yuri, this is part of what I made you to do. This is part of what I've called you to do because there was fruit to it. There was results to it. And, and sometimes we've just got to follow those results. We've got to follow the fruit in our lives where, where God is putting it. But the problem is if I, if, I take the, if, if I take a sports car and I try and plow a field with it, it's not going to be a very successful plowing exercise, okay? Not for the car nor for the field because it isn't made for that. But when I take one of those tractors with the eight wheels and the, you know, the whole deal and I plow the field, that's fantastic, but I don't want to drive in it to, you know, I don't, I, to Florida, okay? Because it's going to be a long drive. It wasn't made for the long drive. It was made for plowing the land. And sometimes in life, we've just got to figure out that I've been made for something in particular. And when I do what I've been made to do, Is it tough sometimes? Is it hard sometimes? I'm not saying it's always easy, but there's fruit to it because I've been made for it. But we live in a society where certain things are put at these things are significant and important. And so people push themselves into that and they end up being round pegs and square holes or square pegs and round holes because society demands it. Go with what God, what greatness God has invested in you. Journey with that. Run with that. Do that. Number four is personality. And personality deals less with your personality in the sense of you're an introvert or an extrovert, and it deals more with your personhood or your identity, right? Does that make sense? So, so what is the identity that God has placed in you? What is the value that God has placed in you? What is the, the idea about who you are? So, so how, do, how do we understand this? Here's the question. What are people around you willing to help you with? So when, 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 when people are around you, what do, what do they say? Let me help you with that. When you're busy with that, people come on board. What are people around you willing to help you with? Because people see part of that. It's next slide, Clyde, if you don't mind. Um, People see something in you. They they identify in you that this is something you're good at. Uh, I love the the Latin word for education. It's the word educari. And and if you go and look at the Latin construction of that word, it, it, it actually refers to not putting information in, but taking information out of something. Pulling, finding the gold in a person and bringing it out. That, that's, that's what we should be doing. We should be, we should be identifying in one another. We should be looking at one another and go, hey, I can see this in you. And there's something that happens when you're busy with your purpose, when you're busy with your destiny, that people go, I'll help you with that. I'll be a part of that. It's been such a great journey for us in, in planting 512 City Church to see people go, hey, I'll be a part of this. I'll, I'll be on board. I'll help you with that. If you're going to do this, I'll be a part of this. Why? Because they identify something in you and they go, hey, I can do that with you. I see that in you. What do people see in you? But maybe if I can take a bit of a rabbit trail here yeah, and just challenge you with this thought. What do you see in other people? What, what, what are you identifying? What gifts are you noticing in people where you want to say, hey, I see this in you. I see this for you. Guys, let's be bold about that. 
Let's allow the Spirit to use us to bring out the gifts and the abilities of people around us. Let pull it, let's pull it out of them. Let's go, hey, I can see this in you. I can, I can sense this about you. I, uh, when you're busy with that, I just want to tell you it's great. I mean, I, I, I won't put her on the spot because she doesn't like it, but a couple of weeks ago, we had a particular volunteer that we, we asked to do the, the, the breakfast in the morning. I want to tell you, I can see that in her. I've tasted and I've seen that she's gifted. It's great. Let's celebrate that about one another. When we see those gifts, when those, we see those things in other people. But the next question on this one is also very important. What are you willing to give 100% of your life for for the rest of your life? See, there, there are some things that I'm good at. There are some things that I enjoy there's some things that as I go through all these questions, I go tick, tick, and, and another tick. I, 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 I want to tell you guys that I used to love making money, man. I, 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 I loved it, okay? I loved doing business. I was, I was six years old when, when, when I ran my first business. By the, by the age of 10, I was competition for the local tax shop to the extent that the tax shop owner complained to the, to the headmaster of the school, and she shut me down through a political process <laughs> because I was taking all her business, Okay, when I, when I was 14, I bought a 1% stake in a gold mine, okay? At the age of 14, I had a 1% stake in a gold mine, and I was playing the stock exchange and making a lot of money. I loved making money. I loved doing business. I loved taking other people's money. <laughs> to this day, you want to play Monopoly with me? Oh, my family's going, you're right. My sister always says, how does he do it? He always wins. It must be a God thing. <laughs> but you know what? When God called me to do what he called me to do, that was no longer worth me. Because he said, I've called you to do something else. Now, God told me that I'm not allowed to have anything to do with business because I think he knew. It's one of those things in my heart that if, if, I, if I got involved, it'll steal my heart. I'll just do that. But now if I look at my life, I, would, I wouldn't want to do anything else than what I'm doing. Why? Because this is the call of God. This is worth me. Now, please don't hear if you've been called to do business and make money and take other people's money. You go for it, man. Because that's worth you. That's what God has called you for. But don't just do it for the sake of doing it and being rich. Make sure that you're doing it with the types of motivations and purpose and destiny behind it that is worth you. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20 says, For you were bought at a price. And then it goes on to say, Live accordingly. Live like somebody for whom the price of Jesus Christ was paid. You were bought at a high price. Whatever you give your life to will be the price tag that you will attach to your life. Because every moment that you spend is a moment spent which you'll never get back. What is worth you? What is worth your life? What is worth that price tag? Because I want to tell you, you can answer a lot of these questions in a certain way, but you can't get past this question. What is worth your life? Number five is experience. So the last thing is the experience. And, 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 and what we're talking about here is we're talking about the way in which God has set you up. God has the ability to set you up for what he's called you to. And I, I wish we had more time to dig into Paul's life, but it's, it's such a beautiful setup. God, God sets Paul up in such a great way to, or sets Saul up to be Paul. I mean, he's, he's trained in the law, which is the law that he needs to preach Christ. He's trained in public speaking, which is exactly what he needs. He misunderstands Jesus, which makes him able to relate to the people he needs to reach. He's, he's trained in both Greek and Hebrew. He, he travels, which is what he needs to do for his call. Everything in the setup, we look back at history and we go, God set you up perfectly. And sometimes we need to look back at our story and say, what is, how has God set me up? I want to tell you that God works all things together for the good for those who love God, which means each and every one of your pains, every one of your failures, every one of your disasters, all of that is a part of the experience he's setting up to do through you what he wants to do through you. 
your training, your experience, your frustrations, your, your heartache, all those things forms part of the setup of God over your life. How do we know this? What, what do other mature Christians say about you is the first question here. Because here's the thing, is, is people around you will see some of that which God has placed in you, but they will also recognize some of those things that God has set you up for. So what is it when you, when, when, when you ask for advice, what do people see in you? What do, what do they see you doing? And, and I want to tell you, we live in such an individualistic society, we've forgotten the fact that we've been called to live in community with one another, where we get to ask other people their perspective. We don't ask enough, not of God and not of one another. Um, Proverbs is full of it. I mean, Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Proverbs eleven fourteen, where there is no counsel, people fall, but in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Um, Proverbs 18, 1, I mean, just keep going. There's so many of these Proverbs that keep speaking about the fact that we can find the purpose and the plans of God through our own experience, but also, also through the experience of others. It's as we look at our story, at our setup, and, and we ask others where to go. Now, now, if you have my incredible, superhuman nonsense of direction, <laughs> yes, no, okay, but I'm terrible at direction. I mean, I, 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 I literally still switch on the GPS to do some menial things in Austin, and I've lived here for a couple of years now. You would think that he would know how to get there by now, but he doesn't because I have a terrible sense of direction. But because I have a terrible sense of direction, Google Maps got it all figured out. Amazing. I don't know how I would have lived before Google Maps, but let's not get into that too much. Here's the thing is in life when we lose direction, just ask for help. Just ask for help. And... 22 years of ministry, there hasn't been a single time that somebody has come to ask for help too early. Not in marriages, not in work, not in life, not in addiction. I, I can't remember one time that somebody came to me asking for help too early. And they left and I thought, hmm, that was a little early. But I want to tell you there's been a lot of times that people have come asking for help too late. When in doubt, Ask. Next question. Which thoughts, visions, and dreams are impossible to get out of your mind? And the, and the, the scripture reference, yeah, I don't have time to dig into it, but, but it's Genesis 37 verse 5, which, which, is, which references the fact that Joseph had a dream, and it simply says Joseph had a dream. It's next slide. Thanks, Craig. Slide. It says Joseph had a dream, and because Joseph had a dream, he lived a life. He never lost that dream. Joseph went from having the dream in his father's house to being in the bottom of a pit, to being sold as a slave, to being a slave in Potiphar's house, to being a jailbird, and throughout what was constant in his life, this dream. He, he never suddenly got a dream for jail reform or got a dream for something else on the, on the process. No, because he knew what God had called him and never went away. And, and as in life, we sometimes have dreams. I, I, I remember a particular time when I had a dream to be Superman, okay? It was in the time when, when Superman was the only real superhero out there. We didn't, grew up, we didn't grow up with Marvel and had so many options. It was just Superman. That was the one, okay? It wasn't Marvel 1, 2, 3, and 44. It was Superman 1, Superman 2, Superman 3. I mean, those things were life-changing, okay? So now some of you don't know this, but, but I, was, I was really a well-rounded young person, okay? I was, I was well-rounded physically, okay? And I loved my Superman suit, tight-fitting, stretchy Superman <laughs> suit. It was quite the sight. Didn't you bring a picture of uh, uh, No, I didn't. I hope there are no pictures of that. Got to think of that. Back to the, I'm all embarrassed. I'm like, oh no, they're going to go looking for a picture. All I'm saying is my mom do not keep good records of things, okay? She might. Fact of the matter is, the dream came and the dream went. But there are some dreams, there are some ideas that stuck with me throughout. 
What are those things that just won't let you go? And sometimes we just never risk to step out and do that. Sometimes we've just got to go, God, I, I believe you enough to do this. Ten questions that I have no answers for you for, but that I want to challenge you to go and answer in the next couple of weeks and months. I went to the trouble of printing it out and leaving you some white space on there so that you can be bugged by this big piece of paper that you can't shove in anywhere to go and answer them. And maybe once you've answered them, don't you want to sit down and write down a purpose statement? The purpose statement for my life is, God created me so that I might. And don't you want to be as bold as to, to take that and write it down and put it up and say, this is what God has called me for. This is what I'm trusting God for today. That if you look at the journey, if you look at the life of Paul, then Saul goes through all these things, all this setup. He thinks that he's got his destiny and his purpose figured out to get rid of the Christian church. And then there's this moment, there's this Damascus Road moment when God comes and he turns it all around and he takes Paul into a whole new direction that would change the destiny of the church, that would change the lives of thousands of millions of people for generations upon generations because of one moment where God took a person's misaligned, mislived life, and he just aligned it with his plan and his purpose for him. My prayer for you is that that would happen for you in this journey. My desire as we conclude this, this series of four weeks on speaking about what it means to live on purpose is that we would know and live our that you would know and live the plan, the purpose, the dream of God for your life. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for every person within the sound of my voice. Lord, I thank you for the fact that every person that hears me praying in this moment is a person that you have destined is a purpose that you, is a person that you have purposed, Lord. There is not one single accident that could ever hear these words because there is no single accident on this planet. Every person, every individual has been called, has been made, has been planned, has been purposed by you. And God, I want to pray that in this moment, at this time, Lord, that people will discover that purpose, will discover that destiny, will discover the ideas of an everlasting, great big God that has dreamt about them, that has made them, that has set them up for a time and a season such as this. So Lord, I pray for Damascus Road experiences, God break-ins, clear destinies, clear visions, clear ideas of what your intents and your plans and your ideas be. And Lord, may it be that because of these moments, because of these discoveries, because of individuals figuring out why it is that they exist, why it is that they breathe, why it is that they are. Lord, as they figure it out, Lord, I pray that the world will not be the same. And Lord, as Paul lived a life that changed the world, may we live lives that change the world as we simply fulfill your call, your plan, and your destiny over our lives. I pray this in the name of the one that has paid the price for us to live in unity and in nearness with you and your plan over our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ alone, I pray. Amen.